Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Ken Goodpaster, and I want to welcome you to the International Business Ethics Case Competition. I will be the uh, overarching judge for this competition, but there will be three uh, primary judges, and those judges, two of whom are in the room, and one of them is online. And I'd like to ask those judges to introduce themselves. My own background, I'm retired now, but I taught uh, business ethics at the University of Notre Dame for 10 years, at Harvard Business School for 10 years, and then at uh, the University of St. Thomas for 25 years. And uh, now I'm called an emeritus professor, which I think Latin, in, emeritus in Latin means over the hill. And, uh, <laughs> uh, so I'd like to ask our two uh, people in the room to introduce themselves. Please first. Sir. Hi, I'm Nancy Gregory. Um, I'm a certified fraud examiner. I'm a CCP, which is a certified compliance and ethics professional. I spent 16 years building fraud cases for attorneys and other fiduciaries. And then I switched over to um, healthcare compliance field that I hope to continue in as I'm currently in transition. My name is Ruth Kraft, and I am a retired New York State judge. So I'm, I was a judge in real life. 14 years. I'm a senior partner at Falcon Rapid and Berkman in New York. My specialty is employment and labor law, and Professor Ben Pastor is, is not generous enough to himself. He is one of the founders of the business ethics um, movement, if you will, in the United States. He's one of the most distinguished professors of business ethics in, in the history of the country, actually. And uh, uh, Leon. Goldman is with us at online. Would you introduce yourself, uh, Mr. Goldman? Sure. Um, I'm Leon Goldman. I'm retired chief compliance and privacy officer for the Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center in Boston and am a emeritus uh, advisory board member to the Bentley um, Hoffman Center for Business Ethics and Prior to all that, I was associate professor of surgery at Harvard Medical School for about 28 years before I got into compliance. So that's who I am. Well, I want to thank all of our judges for taking the time to be with us and to share their expertise with you. And uh, let me set the, set the platform for your presentation. I know you've read this before, but just for the, for the record, in, the, in this part of the competition, you are taking on a fictional business identity and assigning a fictional business identity to the judges. Please make sure everyone knows who you are and who they are before you begin. You will have 25 minutes with a five minute cushion, I'll keep time. Uh, to describe the legal, financial, and ethical dimensions of the problem and to recommend a solution that passes muster on all three counts. During this time, teams will be uninterrupted. When you are finished, the judges will ask you questions for 20 minutes. During the Q&A, both you and the judges will stay in character, in the character you put us in. After the Q&A, the judges will give you feedback outside the role play. Some important things to keep in mind, the ethical aspects of your uh, analysis are the most important part. However, these should be described in a simple, practical, common sense fashion. Using technical philosophical terminology or basing your argument on religious or theological grounds will be considered a serious weakness. Similarly, any uh, member of the team reading his or her part will also be considered a major mistake, although you may use notes. During this presentation, every member of the team must have some sort of speaking role. With that, I turn the floor over to you, from the University of Florida graduate team. Thank you all, Old Dominion Board of Directors, and good morning. We are the Green Gators Consulting Group, composed of myself, Max Bannon. And we are here to share with you all our solution to a issue that's plaguing America's roadways from west to east coast, and that is highway trucking fatalities. To address this, we are proposing a complex two-stage technical solution 
composed of highway level three conditional automation technology, followed by last mile drone delivery. It is our hope followed after this that we will be able to answer the questions of the legal, ethical, and financial implications of our proposed solution, as well as answering the question of how we can conduct business profitably and ethically at the same time. Next slide. Before getting to the problem at hand, here's an introductory story. So just two months ago, traveling westbound on I-495 here in Massachusetts, a Tacoma unfortunately uh, got crushed alongside its driver by a truck that had unfortunately lost control and traveled across the median, crushing the truck as well as the driver in it. While unfortunate and tragic stories like these might seem few and far between in local media, they are part of a much broader issue that is plaguing the U.S.'s roadways. Indeed, this is corroborated by the Chambersburg story with an Old Dominion driver right there when the driver had passed away as well. Uh, however, what if I could have told you that in both of these instances, there could have been another driver in the cabin without having to pay for another driver's wage? Next slide. That brings us to the problem at hand. The National Highway Transport Safety Administration has found that over 20% year-over-year increase in uh, trucking accidents on the roadways, totaling to over 500 million or 500,000 in the year 2021. Of those, about one in 100 proved to be fatal. Uh, and of those fatal accidents, which are caused by trucks, a majority of those trucks are semi-trucks, most similar to the fleet that ODFL operates. Indeed, research has found that of ODFL's fleet, they suffer from an average 11 fatal accidents a year on average. Uh, moreover, the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration cites that uh, whenever there is a fatal accident, the litigation and compensation costs uh, usually average in advance of 7.2 million, which in ODFL's case works out to in excess of 70 million in cost a year dealing with these fatal accidents. When looking towards what is causing these accidents, it's important to know uh, the importance of human error. Indeed, research by Morris King and Hodge has found that 93% of these accidents are attributable to human error as opposed to environmental or mechanical failures. Indeed, of those human error causes, some of the top ones are bad driving practices, intoxication, speeding, and fatigue, per the Clark Law Offices, following up on research by Indiana University. Next slide. There are six levels of self-driving. Level zero being no assistant and level one and two uh, provide partial assistance to the driver, allowing them to steer the uh, vehicle. And levels four and five provide high automation, which do not require a driver at all. We propose conditional automation. That's right. So, the conditional automation lets the vehicle navigate the traffic and reach its destination. But here is the key. The driver is in the vehicle. That means he can intervene whenever necessary. This solution also has another aspect, which uses drones for delivery. The drones can reach remote locations, which take a lot of time and uh, delivery fee for the personnel to reach there which can be reduced with the help of the drones. The vehicle perceives the surroundings by using sensors like camera, LiDAR, and radar, which is then fed into a sophisticated machine learning model, which lets the truck know what decision it needs to take. This solution uses human and machine capabilities seamlessly and provides a safer and efficient implementation. So our first point of ethical consideration is that of human oversight and responsibility. So recognizing technology is a derivative of human progress. While autonomous vehicles are able to navigate certain driving conditions, we maintain that a human driver is still necessary to be in the vehicle to oversee operations and intervene when necessary. We do recognize that this calls into question the division of responsibility between human and machine, but we maintain that the mitigated risk of a human driver present, their potential error outweighs the potential negatives of a fully autonomous trucking system, as would be in a level five integration with no human driver. Current road infrastructure is not currently suited for fully autonomous driving. So as seen in this first image here, Low angle sunlight can often disrupt cameras and give them trouble in perceiving changes in traffic lights and conditions 
like fog or snow can scatter light and make it difficult for lasers to pick up necessary visual information. So this is why we maintain that a human driver is necessary in order to navigate these more complex and nuanced environments. In addition, autonomous trucks cannot fully take into consideration human interaction and cues, such as eye contact or uh, human gestures. This is why even with AI integration, we hold that drivers are still required to receive adequate levels of training in order to maintain safe uh, transportation on the road. Next slide. Our second point of consideration is the subsequent improved working conditions that will result from AI integration. So as previously stated, human error is the number one contributor to fatal crashes at a startling 93%. So while AI integration will also help to protect human life, it will also improve working conditions for truck drivers. So fatigue is often cited as the number one source of human error and AI presence in the vehicle will allow the drivers to not have to drive for the full duration of the trip as the AI will intervene and take over during long haul trucking instances, such as during long stretches of highway. This will help to mitigate some of the stress and other conditions that contribute to fatigue and lead to an overall better working environment for these truck drivers. And this aligns well with Old Dominion's mission of creating a family culture in that it prioritizes worker well-being and is continually making strides to improve working conditions for their employees. Our next point of consideration is that of risk management and mitigation. So risk management is a very important ethical consideration to make, especially when considering emergency scenarios. So in the event of a critical situation, it's important that we are able to maintain control over the truck and safely bring it to a stop. This means establishing fail safes, redundancies, and emergency protocols within level three in implementation. According to the Insurance Institute of Highway Safety, rear end crashes can be prevented up to 50%, which is an important fact to highlight when considering AI implementation. Uh, in addition to protecting human lives, level three automation will also help to prevent large scale uh, chemical spills that often result from these fatal crashes. Large spills are estimated to occur as often as once every day. And in addition to posing a threat to human life and that in some severe scenarios, uh, local residencies have to be evacuated. It can also mean a serious threat to local ecosystems, which can face uh, severe damage with the introduction of these harmful chemicals. So AI integration aligns with Old Dominion's mission of promoting sustainability in that this will help to protect both people and the environment. We place safety above all else, which is why we train our models on how to deal with ambiguous situations by inputting this data into the models. For example, take the picture into consideration. The light is green, in which case your truck can go ahead. But there is a vehicle in the opposite direction that's coming uh, that's running a red light and comes before you. In this case, the vehicle should uh, tries to steer towards the different lane, in which case uh, the vehicles beside are not there, and in which case it will steer towards the right, or the vehicle should come to a stop before hitting the uh, vehicle that's running the red light. So we train our models on these ambiguous situations because we take into account the stakeholders of safety of all the stakeholders involved inside the vehicle and outside the, on the road. We also make sure that our uh, models can understand and work with difficult situations by using resilience. What does this mean? What happens when it when the uh, autonomous truck's tire has blown out? The law regulates that the vehicle be taken to the rightmost lane, and then the driver can get down and change the tire. Our models are trained on how to deal with all these ambiguous situations. One another case is where some of the sensors malfunction, in which case the input from those sensors will be, uh, say, a black pixel. What does our model do? We have redundancies in place where we have different sensors placed at a 
slightly different equation, which gives you a broader view or maybe a narrower view than the original sensor. Our models are trained to work on those images and provide you with the input, uh, with the decisions as it would with the normal initial working sensor. Traditional software uh, has rules based decision making process. AI models take input and it analyzes the patterns and gives out their decision. So, how do we know that we can trust these AI models? That is where transparency and explainability of AI models comes into picture. So, what is transparency? Transparency lets you know what data is being considered, like from the sensors and also tells you what, which factors it is considering to make a decision. What does explainability mean? Explainability gives you the regulatory law and safety considerations it took to come at a particular decision it makes. This helps in analyzing the fairness of the decisions the model takes. They also help you so that regulatory uh, um, agencies can audit your uh, software. Next, we have security. According to Truck Today, there has been a 400% increase in autonomous hacking from 2017 to 2022. So how do we safeguard our autonomous trucks uh, against hacking? So we place measures in place. We have policies that prioritize the security by enhancing the data security and the resource security, in which case is the autonomous truck. So for the security, we have encryption protocols in place. Although we place every measure possible to make sure that uh, that does not happen, there is a slight possibility that your autonomous truck can be hacked, in which case we have uh, a plan in place, which is generally called an incident response plan, which helps you in minimizing the impact it has on the truck by having a truck shut down so that it stops and the, all the uh, uh, data in the truck or the load in the truck will stay in place so that it's locked properly. Next, we're going to evaluate the legal implications of our solution, two of them, before evaluating uh, the legal feasibility of the implementation itself. So to understand our implementation, it's important to understand how our implementation can reduce the liability in the event of driver negligence. The National Highway Transport Safety Administration, as corroborating previous sources we have brought up, uh, finds the top causes of trucking accidents to be attributable uh, to human error. However, through our level three implementation and its use of advanced sensors and algorithms, uh, there, if the AI model is able to help guide the driver and facilitate roadway navigation during normal operation. Indeed, research by Drexel University corroborates this information, finding that advanced driver autonomous systems, as is present in our level three implementation, are able to decrease the accident incident risk by up to 90%. But what does that mean in ODFL's case? That works out to about nine to 10 of those 11 fatalities a year, potentially being preventable. However, what happens in the event that an AI truck still gets into an accident? We've already seen legal precedent already being set in these instances. Indeed, we would be able to see, should it be brought to court, the compensation and litigation costs go down as the courts are able to evaluate more factors relating to the AI truck, such as the system's reliability, the aspect of human oversight over the model, as well as the safety protocols that are baked into the AI model itself. Moreover, as more precedence is set, as more cases go through the courts, uh, it is able to provide increased clarity and precedence for future cases moving forward. Indeed, JD Supra has found three previous case instances where autonomous systems were implemented in vehicles and they found that the data that is collected by these models is able to be given to the court and provide insight on the sequence of events leading up to the crash to potentially exonerate the driver in question. 
And then making note of this slide right here before we go to the next one, you can see the regulatory environment uh, whereby 38 of the 50 US states currently allow implementation uh, of these autonomous systems on public roadways for trucks uh, contingent upon a driver still remaining in the cabin. Next slide. And on that point on regulatory compliance. Uh, so one important thing to note here is that the Federal Highway Administration and the Federal Aeronautical Administration are already establishing uh, guidelines for the proper operation of these systems and the interoperability of the AI models on the roadways, and then how that interacts with our last mile joint delivery and how they interact with one another. Moreover, in adherence to ODFL's commitment to the legal and regulatory compliance for its foundations of success from the Code of Conduct, uh, we are able to potentially mitigate any legal risk that may arise by adhering to these aforementioned regulatory frameworks. Uh, honing in on one of the 50 states in Arkansas, uh, their current policies uh, or legal uh, policy on the book is to require a driver in the cabin. Uh, and as long as that is present, then they're able to operate on any public road in the state. Next slide. Now coming to the financial considerations of our solution. The first one is the financial security for the trucking workforce. So the trucking industry is currently valued at $7.4 billion, and they're a crucial employer for people without college diplomas. Now, having 8 million workers in your industry and having, which constitutes 6% of the entire US full-time workforce, it is a crucial employer in the country. And by maintaining that we want a driver in our vehicles the entire, throughout the duration of the journey, we are maintaining that we can work towards ensuring that all of the employers, employees are financially secure. The next one is time and cost reduction once drones are in operation. So this pertains to our uh, last mile drone delivery, where we are ensuring that uh, places that are otherwise difficult to reach can still be reached using these drones. And this also helps with cost reductions in the long run, because initially, even though there will be um, upfront costs, in the long run, maintenance costs reduce drastically with drones. And by using drones, we can also avoid other issues that come with traffic or road duty directions and things like that um, after getting off the highway. Yes. Um, the next one is superior customer service. So by uh, being able to reach um, customers that are present in remote locations or otherwise customers that generally face delays, we're able to ensure that these will be retained such customers who are otherwise unhappy with the, the current uh, solution. The next one is the research and development tax credit. So this is a tax credit given to companies that are uh, that work towards an innovation and you know, innovative solution, and they have to and these innovative solutions have to be technological in nature. And one of the reason, one of the uh, main criteria that has to be met in order to be eligible for such a tax credit is that you have to be able to limit uncertainty. So by uh, ensuring that we have a person in the vehicle throughout, in addition to the augmented automation that we have in our system, we increase the chances of limiting uncertainty. And that way it becomes much easier to uh, to vouch for such a research and development tax credit while, in, in, while investing in innovation. Uh, the next one is insurance cost deductions. So human error is generally priced into rates given to trucking companies. So by augmenting automation, we're able to reduce the amount of accidents that happen on a yearly basis. And because of this, we uh, can expect insurance companies to give either discounts or even lower premiums. Next one is fuel efficiency. So automated vehicles are generally considered to be more fuel efficient. This is because they have features like optimized driving patterns, reduced traffic congestion, and adaptive cruise control. They also reduce the CO2 emissions that are uh, released. And this is an article by, the, by McKinsey which says that the reduction of uh, CO2 emissions by uh, automated vehicles are 300 million tons lesser per year. So that's a massive um, decrease and um, sustainability and environment protection is something that millennials and Gen Z are also very uh, passionate in, and they value that a lot today. And that, that's the reason this will be a very good 
point for us to put forth for the Gen Z and, and, and to, to be able to rec recruit Gen Z and millennials as well. The next one is promotion of employee retention and organization culture. So by being able to assist our employees in long haul trucking and by allowing them to be less exhausted and more productive throughout their journey, we're we are showing that we're able to put employees first and that is ODFL's mission as well. They want to promote the well-being of their family of employees. So this also has a direct financial implication because by increasing employee retention, we're able to reduce recruitment costs and uh, onboarding uh, costs as well. So in, in conclusion, level three autonomous vehicles introduce transformative era in transportation, promising increased efficiency, safety, and convenience. As we navigate this new frontier, we must prioritize safety, ethics, and security at every stage of development. For future generations, specifically Gen Z and millennials. This not only represents technological advancements, but also offers opportunities for meaningful engagement and provides career opportunities that align with their values of sustainability, efficiency, and ethical use of technology. With a shared commitment to innovation, regulation, and ethical practice, we can pave the way for a more sustainable and safe transportation environment powered by autonomous vehicles. Thank you, and this concludes our presentation. Okay, thank you very much. You left uh, two and a half minutes. Well done on time. Um, so now the judges will stay in the role of uh, members of the board of Old Dominion and uh, respond to your uh, presentation in that role. And uh, let me uh, set the timer here for 20 minutes and uh, invite uh, Mr. Bowman uh, online, if you would be our first uh, responder, um, I'd be grateful. Thank you. Um, it was a very good presentation and I appreciate it. It's a very good overview. Um, but what I'd like to know is if you can give me a better idea of what the actual numbers are and costs of implementing a program like this and how you'd phase it into the entire truck force across the country. And lastly, address a little bit about the fact that ODL also is sort of international, extends into Mexico and Canada, um, how we would deal with that, but specifically looking for questions about actual costs. The will make it back, but as a board of directors, we're going to have to invest up front, and that's going to cost a significant amount of money. What's the payback period? And do you foresee, I mean, from my perspective, listening to this, it would look like there will be layoffs. Not everybody's going to survive this kind of transition. Thank you. For that question, Mr. Goldman. So to answer a few of your questions, the first thing is, uh, while we didn't conduct a comprehensive financial analysis as we weren't tasked for the presentation guidelines, uh, we hold firm in that in the long run, uh, by rolling out this technology across ODFL's fleet of approximately 11,000 trucks, uh, that it would be able to pay itself back in medium term, say five, 10 years time. Uh, however, per vehicle, uh, at the onset, we'd be probably looking at a cost in between a quarter to a million, depending on the ability to retrofit this technology into the existing trucks uh, versus rolling out new trucks entirely. Um, but again, moreover, in the long term, due to the cost reductions of decreased liability, litigation costs, decreased insurance costs, uh, increased efficiency, uh, increased uh, fuel efficiency and route efficiency, um, that it would be able to pay back for itself in the long term. Uh, moreover, to answer your compliance question, uh, we are calling upon the board of directors to roll this out in the U.S. jurisdiction specifically, given that uh, a comprehensive regulatory framework hasn't been established for these technologies in uh, ODFL's other jurisdictions, such as Mexico, as you had suggested. Um, so that is the first phase of this rollout. However, we would be more than happy to come back at a later point uh, and reevaluate expanding that rollout uh, moving forward. And then on your third point regarding the potential layoffs, it's important to note that 20% of U.S. trucking positions are currently unfilled, and under the Level 3 implementation, the driver is still preserved in the cabin. 
So we hold that there would be no layoffs under our proposed implementation and any potential uh, shifts in the job market would just be in places that currently aren't being served. That's why we put in the drone implementation as the last mile. This is to be able to reach customers that currently aren't being reached by trucks to begin with in highly dense urban areas that don't have road access alongside rural areas that aren't reached by trucks currently. Did that answer your question? Yes, thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, Judge Kraft? Yes. Let me ask another question applicable to the labor. Um, is the labor force of the company unionized? That is a good point. ODFL is not union. It is not union. Yeah. And certainly That's there the is video. toward you. It's just the like by the so I don't know if we just selected the wrong source in video. Sorry. <laughs> I can keep going. Okay. So something is bothering me, and that is the last smile. Um the last mile, all of us who received deliveries from Amazon.com, right, know that deliveries may come into our area with these huge semi trucks, with this highly professional force of drivers. As you noted, there, there, is, there are openings at that level. But when they come into my community, they're in little box trucks, right? And those people typically are contractors making the minimum wage. I am trying to understand um, you know, the ramifications for workforce in the loss of those jobs will be they poorly remunerated by virtue of the use of the drone. What are the ethical consequences, noting that many of those drivers who are driving the small vehicles or driving their own vehicles, frankly, um, um, are immigrants, um, are individuals who, who have not completed this very comprehensive um, training program that is required to be a driver of the semi-truck. So who can answer that one? Yeah, so I can uh, start us off with that question. Thank you again. Um, I think what's important to firstly establish is that Old Dominion does not necessarily do parcel services. So when you think of individual packages, that's the Amazons, that's the FedExes, those are usually delivering individual packages, whereas Old Dominion does large freight trucking which means that they're delivering palletized loads. So it's usually an entire truck full of maybe one product on a pallet with thousands of units. So their locations are, this is for the long haul trucking, so we'll address your last mile question, but as for the long haul trucking, they are staying mostly on highways and delivering to distribution centers that are often outside of urban areas. So those in particular would not be traveling through your neighborhoods. As for last mile delivery, we are, as we mentioned earlier, there's a current deficit in the number of truck drivers in the industry. And of course, we maintain that just because there is a deficit, that doesn't mean that they aren't still necessary. So we're hoping that with these new AI implementations, it will give the company a newer facelift and hopefully encourage a younger generation to help join our workforce. But as for the last mile delivery, because there is a deficit, we're using those drones to supplement that deficit and to supply packages to more remote areas or areas where um, routes aren't necessarily accessible. But there was reference to, quote, highly dense urban areas without roads. And I'm trying to think, I'm a New Yorker, where is there a highly dense Sorry. urban area that doesn't have a road? I may have misspoke. Highly dense urban areas and rural areas that do not have road infrastructure. Thank you for that. OK. And, and, and finally, when we talk about the um, decrease in litigation exposure, decrease in insurance costs. Drones flying in the air are not um, are not potentially without their own risks. Have you done for us as the board cost benefit analysis, not just of the physical cost of buying the drone, but the cost, the, what, what cost an insurance company might impose upon us? That was a good point. The job. Yeah, so again, we weren't tasked with com uh, doing a comprehensive cost benefit. However, we hold that in the long term for, to touch on first the, the long haul uh, trucking, we would be able to reduce the insurance costs, uh, similar to how Geico allows you to have an app that uh, exfolds uh, data uh, and sends it to the insurance company to be evaluated, seeing if you're speeding, uh, to be able to decrease your costs. So too with this autonomous system, decrease those insurance costs. And we would hold that this offset, uh, while we would have to, of course, ensure the fleet and make sure it's in compliance with the FAA standards, 
uh, that insuring a drone would be much cheaper than uh, insuring another truck. So the reduction in truck costs would be higher, we hold, uh, than the increase in cost by having uh, this new package for the drone. But aren't you guessing? Yes, that's a good point. But again, this is novel technology and we haven't seen a whole fleet rollout. So we wouldn't be able to evaluate in ODFL's instance how much that would cost. One more so question. Have you done a beta? That is a good question. So there have been data, but again, ODFL isn't in this market currently. Uh, press releases from the board of directors have found that they're interested in these autonomous solutions. However, there haven't been a beta as of yet. And again, our role is as the consulting company bringing this. Uh, are you recommending one? Yes, we are We are suggesting this technology. And then also to go with what my colleague stated uh, in regards to just the fact that this is novel technology. Uh, we haven't seen another company yet introducing a fleet of drones that would do exactly what we're doing here. So we're hoping that as we move forward with this revolutionary technology, that it will become more standard practice in the industry and in that, you know, litigation costs and insurance costs would decrease with time as it becomes more standard and as policies are put into place. It's Gregory. Hi. I have a bunch of questions. I probably won't get to all of them. So one of mine um, is you say the driver's going to be in the truck, um, but the fact that they're not going to be doing all of the duties that they used to do, is their compensation going to go down in any way because you know their duties are less strenuous or you know they're not spending as many hours doing what they used to do? That's a good point. So uh, as part of our solution, we are not advocating for a decrease in uh, labor compensation. Uh, we hold that by decreasing the cost already on ODFL's books that you would be able to expand your profitability uh, without cutting the wages of the employees. Again, uh, we hold uh, ODFL's commitment to its current employee base, and we're not calling for any reduction in labor costs or the amount of employees you currently hold. Uh, we're just saying that you would see the increased profitability through the other reductions. Did that answer your question? Yes. It's so another question. Uh, the companies that have been using these drones have been delivering very small parcels. So Walmart and Amazon are the best examples of those, and they are basically subsidizing those drone deliveries. And it's really only one small package. And you know, it, on average, they're they're subsidizing like ten bucks per package. You're talking about palletizing yeah. very large deliveries. I'm just wondering, first of all, the cost there seems huge, but the safety factor seems even more risky. We have seen in Gaza. When they were trying to palletize food and deliver it, that they actually crushed a child when they delivered some of the food supplies. And you're talking about going into urban areas where the you know the potential for harming life um, seems to be extreme. Um, in addition, the fact that the companies that have been using um, drone technology have only been using it in certain states, um, only a handful of states, um, which are largely more uh, less urban centered states and more rural. So I'm just wondering, um, it seems to me that the risk would be incredible for dropping a pallet somewhere. Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, so we have our long haul freight trucks that will bring the palletized load to the distribution center. And that's where that pallet will be, um, you know, either continued in trucks to say Publix or other like distribution stores. Um, but for our last mile drones, we would actually hold that that power would be dismantled. And we actually considered this briefly with like pharmaceutical products. Um, using last mile drones um, to deliver those with increased efficiency. But those would be they wouldn't be full palletized loads because that is um, largely out of the scope of our uh, resources right now. But um, just considering exactly what you said, like safety measures and um, all of that. But they would be delivering a broken down. It wouldn't be the full palette. It would be um, smaller pictures. I would also just throw to Cal in that uh, similar to the, the safety features we're implementing in the AI model for the trucks, so too would there be contingencies in the drone model as well. But... And we won't just be dropping the packages. The package would, and we are going to probably place it on the ground or uh, allocated block for it. Okay. How are you going to address the fact that only 38 states out of 50 are actually willing to um, agree with this level That's a good three? Point. Because if you're doing long haul trucking, you're crossing the entire United States. So you're going to have to have some serious logistics in terms of how you can skirt the states that are not in favor of this approach. 
I agree. Yeah. So what we are suggesting to the board is essentially the first phase of a rollout. And while there would be uh, there would have to be effort into making sure the implementation doesn't go through these states that don't currently allow it. Uh, this would be part of the first rollout, and that would have to be baked into the operations and the route planning. Um, so, of course, you would have to omit this technology in states that currently don't permit it. But again, this is the first stage, and uh, this data is from 2022. So as we look forward to the future in the states that don't currently permit it, it's already in the works, uh, and it's just more of a, a regulatory um, backlog uh, before they can get to uh, setting standards in their state or rolling it out. Did that answer your question? Yes, I guess my, my question still remains though, in terms of um, highly populated urban areas, uh, New York, Boston, LA, for instance, how is this system even gonna work? Uh, because the drone, it, it seems to me once you get down to the drone level, because you're not gonna be removing pallets and drop them in the middle of LA. Yeah. Um, that the cost would be huge if you're going to break it down into small little parcels. We've already seen Amazon and Walmart losing money on this proposition. Okay, could you could we go back to the, the implementation slide? I mean, can this really be scaled? I guess it gets down to um, outside of uh, very rural areas. Right there. Yeah, so that's a very good question again. Um, so currently under the current implementation, trucks go to the distribution center and then uh, a new truck is able to get those broken down loads and bring it to the end user, right? But uh, while uh, recognizing your point that currently there would be uh, subsidies to be able to have this last mile of drone delivery, we hold that in the long run as um, the insurance companies are able to evaluate these fleets that that uh, carrying cost of these fleets would decrease and we wouldn't have to have that subsidy in long. So if you're putting in a second truck, is there automation in that truck? So I'm saying current uh, implementation without AI has that second truck from the distribution center to end user. Right. Our solution is um, instead that it is going to be the drone and that's supplanting uh, what's currently in the workforce deficit of that 20%. Does that answer your question? Not really, because I no, think that the issue is that um, you'd be breaking it down into such, such small packages yes. um, that you know, there would be any cost efficiency there. In addition to the fact that implementing a drone system yeah. is incredibly expensive because you either have to outsource it to another, uh, put to a third party, or you have to build it yourself as Amazon has done. And, and I'm doubting that the whole Dominion can actually come up with that technology itself. Um, you know, in the way that Google and Amazon have done, you'd also have additional costs actually hiring third party to do this. But we're not advocating for a third party. Uh, we're coming to Old Dominion with a post solution. Old Dominion has 11,000 drivers, but it also has 12,000 other support employees of which they do have a technical staff that would be able to help develop this implementation. Uh, and then moreover, could you repeat the first part of your question? Just make sure. Uh, I just don't even remember. It's in your mind. Move forward here, uh, just because I'm selfish. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, could you go to the slide that had all the different levels of AI? One slide back? I think. Yeah, that one. That one went by a little too quickly for me, and I wanted to ask a question. Ah. Yes, thank you. Um, I'm, I'm nervous about mission creep. <laughs> that is to say, I'm AI is going to evolve. We all know that. Are the levels going to evolve with AI? That is to say, are you going to start moving to level four as AI evolves? We recommend uh, placing ourselves in level three, which will have a driver in the car, but further down the line, the uh, truck or operation could be increased like 24 by 7, making sure that driver is going to be in the car, but he doesn't have to be active fully. The vehicle is going to alert the user when it meets the driver's input. So, which would, uh, uh, which means we could increase the efficiency of deliveries by reducing the time. Well, I'm not sure I understand. What, what is level four? No drivers? Yes, level four is uh, 
there will be high driving automation and even if uh, it uh, finds a situation it will try to resolve to uh, fail safe or, or, or even if it encounters the worst case scenario it will have some sort of automation in it that uh, it will either come to a stop for example in a bad weather condition where it can't see properly if the vehicle is going to come to a stop at the side of the because so we're, you're, you're telling me we're not on a slippery slope here yeah, so you all are not going to have drivers except four and five. Except four and five, everyone, every level has drivers involved. And our uh, proposed solution is going to stay in level three even further down the line. It's just that the driver uh, work is going to be reduced, but he's going to be in the vehicle 24 by 7 operation of the vehicle. So, driver doesn't have to be active all the time. Just when the vehicle alerts the driver of the situation that it encountered that it can't uh, rectify, that's when the driver comes into action. And then taking a step back on your question, during our brainstorming phase, we actually constructed a decision matrix on all the different implementation scenarios of the AI. And we came to on the financial, legal, and ethical uh, considerations that uh, legality wise, uh, very few states, I believe less than a dozen, allow. Uh, uh, an autonomous vehicle on public roads without that driver. So on, it doesn't pass muster for a level four and five currently. Uh, for financial, there would be increased implementation costs of a level four and five implementation because you would have to have a more complex system being put in place. Uh, and then the ethical concerns, again, uh, going back to uh, supplanting the workforce, uh, we didn't feel that it made sense. Uh, and it would be in contrast to ODFL's commitment to its employees uh, to then call for those employees to be cut. I fully appreciate that. And I think that makes a lot of sense. But you're paying me big money to be on your board to think of the future. Yeah. And I'm thinking of the future, and I'm thinking of AI in the future. And I'm thinking we're going to be behind the times at some point when other companies are using level four and states are going along with it. Yeah, they're not going along with it now. I get that. Mm -hmm. But I have just run out of time. And now you get to hear from us out of out of our roles if, if you put us in. And uh, let me go back to Mr. Goldman. Uh, what are your uh, thoughts? We have very little time, uh, I'm afraid. So I'm going to ask us to be to be concise. It was a very good presentation. I think that um, you did a very good job doing it, but I uh, think you'd bit off more than you could chew in trying to do the whole implementation from start to finish, uh, considering I'm not sure uh, how much of the business of the company is actually the last mile. And in implementing this, I would think that the first stage is just getting the pallets to the distribution center, because there's a whole other world of drones and laws and airports and other things. But I think as a presentation, this was well done. You considered a lot of problems and you're able to answer the questions well. Thank you. Thank you. Um, any comments you might have? about that? No? OK. Uh, Judge Crabb. This looks like a simple problem, but it's very complicated. That's the truth of it. And as I was listening to uh, Nancy's questions, I started thinking about Tesla, because Tesla has partially automated vehicles, but it has fully created liability and debts with those vehicles. And that wasn't a drag, the ethical element of that. And that's a known fact in small cars, let alone semi-trucks. Uh, I think it would have been rich if you had managed to address that and get past it, because as board members, we are obligated to consider the legal exposure. And I saw this as a lawyer, as creating more exposure than it was worth albeit in, in uh, technological progress. Um, but I think, I think it's, it, as I said, it looks superficially like an easy subject, but it wasn't. Um, I think you did a very well, good job. You're all very, very articulate. You, Max, 
said to every question we asked, that's a really good question. Yeah. You know, those, that was uh, um, classic consultant technique. <laughs> <laughs> but congratulations. It's funny you mentioned the Teslas because our Uber driver this morning was a Tesla and we got to talking about it and he was like even recognizing the downsides of the technology. He's like, yeah, sometimes it's kind of funny for us. So that is funny you mentioned that. Um, I think you did a great job trying to break down the ethical, I think, with the others, although I, I recognize that they weren't supposed to be as robust. I think there were a lot of gaps there and things needed to be considered. And I think one of them was FAA regulation, which is absolutely a nightmare. Yeah. Um, not centralized in any way, it's different across all states. And so I think there are huge costs that would be associated with trying to lobby to get some new rules and regulations around the drones. Um, also, I would just say in presentation, um, don't ever wear sneakers in front of a board. Um, well, that is like, what did you you say? don't wear sneakers when you're presenting oh. to a board. And um, in terms of you know how you posture yourself, never put your hands in front or in back. They should always be by your side. Um, not stiff, but just relaxed. Um, Otherwise, you know, it looks like you don't know what to do with your hands. Um, I also would have liked a little bit more um, information on, you know, what the other issues of damaging the packages you're, you're sending by drone. You know, they drop them or, you know, they just break when they land. Uh, you know, there are financial costs, which are uh, issues of the ethical costs that they might cause harm, or you might also, you know, do things customer uh, loyalty because those drones might misdeliver that packet to somewhere else and, and you're really going to upset your customers if, um, if those packages are not going to You're going to be moving tomorrow into your 10-minute presentation in ethics and then of course the crazy 90-second one on the elevator. But with respect to your 10 minute presentation, uh, looking forward to that, um, one of the aspects of your ethics portion talks about safety. And I think that's a very critical part of the ethics dimension. But one thing you might want to keep in mind as you get ready for tomorrow is that uh, a critic might be tempted to say, Safety for whom? You know that ethics involves stakeholders. You, everybody knows that. But AI involves programming to put priority on certain sorts of lives. Uh, whose lives come first? The life of the driver, the life of the child that has a pallet. <laughs> dropped on uh, us. I mean, there, there needs to be some kind of oversight on the on the priorities of this automaton. And that doesn't come from another automaton. It comes from a human being. And the the ethics of safety involves um, human conscience. And I think that that sometimes that gets overlooked in the, in the discussions of AI, uh, that ultimately AI gets its conscience from people. And if you're gonna put a lot of emphasis on safety, you really need to make sure that safety is understood in a very human sense, the, sense, the kind of sense that you would have a driver paying attention to traffic and someone who ran, ran a red light, uh, somehow you've got to package that into your AI or else it, it's not moral, it's not ethical. And I, I know you know all these things, but I think that if you're going to emphasize the ethical dimension tomorrow, you want to make sure you've covered yourself on that front. Does that make sense? Yeah. AI is also biased. I'm sure yeah. you've all read that. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. it's only as good as the people who are programming it. So if you're if you only have say white males, you know a certain demographic that are putting in the, uh, the inputs, um, 
you're inevitably going to have a problem. And we've seen all the failures of AI, particularly in like hiring practices, for instance, where it self-selects for men, not women, for certain races, and all of that. So it just it's also another ethical concern about whether you actually get the you get the right input. Yeah, it's actually make it useful. We evaluated that from the ideation phase, but only so many of the ethical concerns could be brought up in the presentation. And we kind of brought up as fairness in the explainability part. How to go. Actually, fairness means not having any bias in the area. Yeah, well, probably say that more explicitly yeah, in good the 10 minute presentation. Yeah. Nice job.